Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this morning. Doug spent 31 years with Trader Joe's company, the last 14 as president. During his time as president, Doug grew Trader Joe's from a small nine-store chain in Southern California to a nationally acclaimed retail success story with more than 340 stores in 30 states. He developed their prize buying philosophy, created their unique private label food program, and wrote the ex and executed the business plan for expanding Trader Joe's nationally. He received his executive MBA from the Peter Drucker School of Management at Claremont University, where he won several honorary awards, including the Early Career Outstanding Entrepreneur Award from Peter Drucker. Doug retired from Trader Joe's in 2008 and is now the CEO of Conscious Capitalism. Much of his time is currently spent working on an innovative nonprofit solution to the issue of food waste, hunger, and obesity by bringing high quality, nutritious food at affordable prices to the under, underserved in our inner, inner cities. Doug is a senior fellow at Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative, a trustee at Owen College, <coughs> chairs the Board of Overseers at WBUR, Boston's NPR news station, and serves on the boards of several nonprofit and for profit companies. During this morning's workshop, Doug will be looking at how Trader Joe's reinvented food retailing in America and what that might mean for the future of grocery retailing. Drawing upon his many years of experience, he will discuss that he thinks, can, what he thinks can be done to revitalize this sector. Following his presentation, I will open up the floor to questions from the audience. Without any further ado, please welcome Doug Rao. Wow. First of all, after I listened to that, I think, I must have really done something amazing. Uh, well, first I'd like to thank Western Growers Association for the opportunity to share something that I think is uh, uh, a lot of fun. And turns out, perhaps, can be important as we think about grocery retailing moving forward. Uh, I was thinking about when they said uh, dress was business casual today, so I thought about wearing my Hawaiian uh, sports coat, but um, I thought maybe that wouldn't be appropriate. But it, it is an honor to be here, and I say that in all humility, and I do take great pride in my humility, so um, <laughs> I think that as Mike mentioned, what we're going to talk about today is sort of a, a a look at how Trader Joe's went from being basically, this was how Trader Joe's started. Most people don't know that. There was a Joe, there is a Joe. His name's Joe Colomb. And uh, at the time he was working for Rexall Drug in their real estate research department. And he ran across this chain of small convenience stores in Texas that he thought was a brilliant idea. It was 7-Eleven. So Trader Joe's actually owes its existence to 7-Eleven. Kind of a surprise. And it owes it twice. First, in 1958, when they opened as Pronto Markets. Some of you in Southern California remember, may remember that banner name. Pronto Markets was around until mid-80s when the final one closed or was expanded, turned into a Trader Joe's. But in 1958, in May of 1958, the first Pronto Market opened. And then 7-Eleven came into the Southern California market. And what happened was, by the mid-60s, here suddenly was this very small, undercapitalized, convenience store chain that was facing a much stronger, much better capitalized, and much more aggressive chain called 7-Eleven. And that's when Joe stepped back, thought about it, and reinvented Pronto Markets, came up with the concept of Trader Joe's. So the first Trader Joe's, when it opened, didn't look anything like, and you wouldn't recognize it from today. Uh, it was completely different. And that's part of the process that I'm going to talk about is the fact of constant reinvention. So the real question I want to address is how this company that started as this 
could end up on the front page of this, being lauded as the hottest retailer in America, also the most secretive. You know, you know, I may or may not say it's the hottest retailer, but certainly there's no question that, that Trader Joe's is a success, a major success, and has raving fans. So the real question is, how on earth did it go from this convenience store, a 7-Eleven, to becoming a banner child for retail on the front of one of the great business magazines? So, first, no, this isn't a picture of me, by the way. Um, first, I think it's always important to step back and go, the most critical decisions that you make in many times in your life, personally, but also as a business, is you have to start with why. If you just, if, if, if any one of us in business can describe what we do, and hopefully we every now and then think about how we do it, but surprisingly little energy is spent on why. Why, why do we exist? And so when we started looking at Trader Joe's and the concept of Trader Joe's and its evolution, that first of all, the success of Trader Joe's clearly is a team. As each one of you that runs a business and is involved in any type of business knows, it takes a lot of people to deliver great results. So I just want to acknowledge that right up front is that uh, I had a wonderful opportunity and has a lot of DNA of mine in, in Trader Joe's and had a great chance to step in at the right time and have some pivotal, pivotal uh, moments of, of change and reinvention. But it took now in excess of 30,000 crew members to execute on that every single day and deliver on it. So just a shout out to them. But, if, but for any organization, it starts with why. Why do you exist? Who would miss you if you disappeared is another way of asking. If you disappeared, who would miss you? So, of course, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons. <laughs> Never ever think outside the box. <laughs> Clearly didn't apply to Trader Joe's. And one of my favorite traffic signals in Boston. Uh, Okay, maybe it's not in Boston. But once you start to figure out why you think you exist, what's your purpose, what's, your, what's, what's the reason why a customer, why someone would do business with you, then the next step is you've got you to have a, some guardrails on it. You've got to focus. Because, you know, corporate America's graveyard is full of companies that lost their focus, that lost their way. And over the years, as Trader Joe's has had success and has reinvented itself, one of the most difficult decisions that management had was to keep focused because customers, when they like what you deliver, want you to expand that far greater than your own capabilities and natural strengths are. So years ago, they wanted Trader Joe's to get into mail order. You know, why don't you do mail order like Land's End and L.O. Bean? And then it was the internet. Uh, etc. And uh, why don't you franchise and why don't you go international and etc. So I call this the E squared equals zero problem. When you try to be everything to everybody, you oftentimes end up being nothing. So really critical for us in our business, and this was true for Trader Joe's, was stay focused. And there's a lot of great companies that, that we know do that. I love to fly Southwest Airlines, for instance, because it turns out everybody flies first class, right? <laughs> and we all enjoy the same fine cuisine. And the entertainment is, um, shall we say, personally selected. And so I think that uh, what they do is they do one thing really well, which is why they are, you know, with pretty much uh, any, without argument, the most successful airline for the last 30 years is they just focus, focus, focus. Since this is a talk on, to a group of foodies in the food industry from a retailer, I thought this would be an appropriate picture of a really key element of any company's success. You're gonna guess what this is pretty quick, right? Culture. Turns out, as Drucker said, 
Culture eats strategy for lunch. Nowadays, because things happen so quick, you'd have to say breakfast. Uh, one of the main learnings I had in business, this is all preamble, just to get the setup for Trader Joe's. Don't worry, I'm not going to. Uh, I'll actually get into something that has to do with specifically with Trader Joe's in just a moment. But these are the foundations that are really critical. Why do you exist? Staying focused. And if you're going to do anything as an executive, if you can do anything as an owner, a leader, focus on the culture that you're creating in the company more than your strategy. And the reason for that is that I got battle scars and scar tissue as do most business leaders when you come up with a great strategic idea and you try to put it into the company and it turns out it's not quite a fit for, this, for the culture. That you didn't spend enough time preparing the ground, so to say. And it's sort of like an organ transplant to the wrong blood type. It gets an, an automatic rejection every time. So, you know, uh, took some time, but finally learned if you focus on the culture, you focus on that one secret ingredient that no one else can copy. Because it turns out culture is incredibly difficult for someone else to copy. Your competitors will have a really hard time copying your culture. You know, they can copy your products and, you know, trade dress and whatever else there is, but boy, they have a hard time copying culture. So culture is really key as a spot to start and have strategy develop out of that. So part one of reinventing retail for Trader Joe's was buying. What Trader Joe's is really all about, in my opinion, are really two key elements. The first of these is buying. So when I was hired, Trader Joe's didn't look anything like it does today. It was basically a 7-Eleven with a great wine section. They had figured out how to private label wine and really break price on some great brand names that they put them in their label and sold them for you know, significant discounts. And it was the exact same wine. This was in 1977, and I was like 25 or six years old. So when I was asked, hey, do you think you could get us in food the way we're in wine? I said, sure, because I needed a job. And, <laughs> and I had worked uh, for the natural food industry uh, for a couple of years and uh, had actually turned out to be a great learning ground, uh, by the way, for the grocery industry. Because at that time, you had to ask all the journalistic questions. You know, what, when, where, why, who on everything that was being produced, so you really had to know your product. Turns out, so if we're buying, Trader Joe's, when you walked in the front door, it looked just like a 7-Eleven. I mean, it had Hostess cupcakes and Ding Dongs and Wonder Bread and Budweiser and cigarettes and everything else, and a great wine section. They had just gotten a couple years earlier into cutting cheese and wrapping it in the store on some uh, Jarlsberg and Brie and things like this. And this was a real first venture into that sort of specialty food, um, what they were referred to as specialty food, which was a label that Trader Joe's labored under for a number of years was that, oh, you're that party store. We go, whenever we have a party, we go there and we get our cheese and our wine and our nuts. And uh, instead of thinking of them as a basic food company. So my job was, well, how is this little chain, at that time there were nine Trader Joe's and eight of these leftover little pronto markets doing, uh, the Trader Joe's doing around 12 million a year or so. How is this company going to compete in the marketplace? How are we gonna create the same value in food that we do in wine? I mean, in Southern California at that time, I mean, Vaughn's and Ralph's, and there were 17 supermarket chains in Southern California at that time. Many of us are old enough to remember that. You know, everything from Thrifty Mart and, you know, uh, uh, Hughes, and I, I'm trying to, my brain's now stretching to think of all these names of, of uh, uh, chains that, that got gobbled up and disappeared. Um, Fazio's, is that the name of the chain, I think? Yeah, Fazio's and Alpha Beta and just, they used to get the certified blue book and it'd have the list all, all the chains there and their pricing and things like this that, uh, uh, so there were like 17 of them. So how's Trader Joe's gonna compete? What are they gonna do? There's this, tiny small company. So first thing we did, we stepped back and said, well, you can't basically play on the same terms. You're gonna to have to rewrite the rules. So 
One of the first things we did was we did an active, not a passive form of buying. We literally started to become really educated and have a buying team that started to travel around the world. Started to dig into places where you normally wouldn't find things. Started to work directly with the manufacturers. And in the process, it turns out knowledge really is power because we started to find things and, and learn about things that basic grocers didn't, didn't know. That allowed us to do product development in a different type of way than had been done. But it was a bold move because at the time, what Trader Joe's had was everything basically came from certified grocers, now called Unified, and in the Springfield label or other national brands. So when we got involved with the concept we're going to buy direct. We're going to do what's called disintermediation. We're going to cut out the middlemen because, frankly, it's the only way we can afford to deliver value. And in the process, we decided that we were going to have to go private label. So why did we decide that? It's not because, contrary to what some people may think, Trader Joe's are egomaniacs. That may be true, but that wasn't why. Private label is done to deliver value. So the reason that Trader Joe's private labels, and that private label, by the way, has become um, so popular in many areas in the grocery field today, is that we reinvented at Trader Joe's sort of the concept of private label for mass marketing. Up until that time, in the 70s, private label was either, as you may remember, the old generic or you know, plain wrap, and it was, it was if you got a can of peaches in, in a private label, you knew it wasn't the quality of national brand. It was going to be a regular cut. It was going to be a price play. And that's all right. Our challenge was we wanted to go out and say, what if we did it differently? By buying direct, could we actually deliver the same high quality or more at a better price? So it ended up where we cut out a ton of SKUs. We started saying, all right, what if we set a really high bar? No product in the store is going to be there unless we can either have the best price, everyday price in town, or it's distinctive, or it offers something nutritionally that you can't get. For instance, back then, a lot of product had you know, MSG and artificial colors, and many of you may not remember, but pistachios used to be red uh, because they were imported from Iran at the time, uh, in this, through the 70s. And they didn't have the uh, uh, capabilities, the technology, to be able to get the skins off before the tannin stained the, skin, the shell. And so they, they dyed them. They'd be red, they'd be white, they'd be all kinds of colors. And you eat them and your mouth would turn, you know, literally red. And so we came out, you know, with that time California just had the beginning of their pistachio industry. This is before, obviously, 1979, the embassy uh, takeover and all the hostage issue. So we started selling pistachios that were natural. And the big idea was, oh my gosh, here are pistachios that don't have red dye on them. As a selling point, as a differentiation. And what we did, we started dropping products radically. At the time, Trader Joe's carried, oh, maybe 5,000, 6,000 SKUs, which as you know, for a grocery chain is very small, but still about 6,000 SKUs. At one point, we got down to about 1,300 and realized that that was kind of too thin. That was a little maybe uh, uh, anorexic. And so we started adding SKUs and, and, and kind of came back to around uh, 2,000, 2,500 or so. But in that process of limiting SKUs, there was a really important point. We had to tell ourselves that we're going to be a store of stories. Every product that's there has to have a reason to be here. And if we can't expose to ourselves clearly what that reason is, it shouldn't be here because we certainly can't then espouse it to a customer. And right away, by the way, that's a radical fundamental change in the way most grocery is done, which is, is there a reason if you could have a customer say, why do you carry this product? Did you can actually tell them that it's a better value or it's a unique product you had created where it's different than anything else and or it's the same product you find over here, but we took out all the MSG and artificial color or whatever, flavor and preservatives. So it was a pretty radical stance and it ended up radically cutting back on the number of SKUs. So what we did in this process was redefine value. So anybody can sell 
a high quality product if you don't care what you're paying for it. And anybody can sell for the lowest price in town if you don't care what the quality is. The hard part for us was to consistently try to deliver high quality at a lower price than they could get elsewhere. And as I mentioned, the way we did this was we got ruthless at telling that we're going to have a story to tell about it, we're going to buy direct. And when we bought direct, that meant we're not playing the everyday games on, on promotional advertising, we're doing everyday low price, which back in the 70s was unheard of. And we are stripping all those additional costs out of the product. Finally, we started looking at our suppliers as our partners and that we wanted to create win-win relationships with them. Once you start doing private label aggressively with a target that it might end up being a very high percentage at the time it started very small when I first started out, but as you know it's now 80-85% of everything they sell, that you don't want to rotate through suppliers very fast. It's very disruptive. You want to find good companies you want to make sure that you can work with them for a long time, that they're making money, that it's a win for them, but because you've structured this differently in a relationship, it becomes a win for the customer. So that together you are partners in delivering that great value to the customer. And we were successful at it. Better lucky than good, as they say. So uh, here's a private label, uh, a private uh, label tasting, and uh, we call it a blind tasting. And you can, see, you can see why. There's a photo that was done for the uh, LA Times. And what I want to highlight about this is that when we went out and started looking at product, what product did we go look for? One of the keys was we took a focus that said, we're our customer's purchasing agent. We're going to take this radical concept that we exist to deliver value to our customers and that we are their agent. If that's the process, then when we start to try product, let's try it blind to what our margins are, blind to where it, which vendor it's coming from, and try it just like a customer. Because at the end of the day, particularly if we private label it, they're not gonna know which vendor it came from. They don't care what our margins are. They don't care about any of that other stuff. Let's just try it. And just as importantly, everyone at the tasting had an equal vote. Didn't matter if you're president of the company or you're the receptionist, you're a customer. You, one, one person, one vote. This is before Citizens United. So, uh, the, uh, uh, can I say that in Arizona? I think so. Uh, so this is, this, is the, uh, this is the, one of the secrets to Trader Joe's is the fact that they had a relentless focus on are we delivering value from the customer's point of view. Turns out, surprisingly, that was a radical idea in grocery retailing. One of our first private label items, uh, we did a lot of crazy things. For instance, I don't think you can see this, but uh, there's down in the corner here it says $4.99. That was the price of a pound of vitamin C. But this is where we, I, I put this up because one of the things Trader Joe's did was it decided to add complexity. Most grocers try to get complexity out of their system. Trader Joe's for many, many years in building private label added complexity. So we'd buy almonds in 50 pound boxes and bag them in the store. Same with pistachios. We'd buy products like cashews directly, send them to a nut roaster and processor who didn't own the cashews, simply roasted the product for us. In this case, uh, vitamin C we bought from uh, Roach Brothers. No, not Roach Brothers, uh, Roach, oh, Roach Industries I think, right? The vitamin C people. They used to be at least, many years ago. And uh, Roach Brothers is a, a grocery chain out in uh, Boston, so excuse me, I kind of my mind went, that's not right. So uh, what we did was we buy these in large drums and then have them packed up for us, because at that time, back in the 70s, people thought vitamin C, particularly in the loose ascorbic acid form, was the cheapest and the best way to take it. And as you can tell, we spent a lot of money on the, on the, on the type and on the, on the color and the label, so this was... Uh, First of all, I must confess, I did this as a mock-up, gave this to Joe Colomb, he said, oh, I like that, just like that, let's use it. I said, oh my God, you're kidding, it's like my printing's really not very good. He said, no, that's great, it adds that homey effect, I like it. So our very first, kind of one of our private labels of my pathetic uh, printing, block printing, uh, we quickly got over that. So 
what happened was we started to develop these products. And we started to use and take advantage of it. So here's an instance where 31 years ago, I got my 15 minutes of fame. But this, I point this out not just to show what a nut I could be, because People Magazine wants you always to goof off, which because of Trader Joe's we love doing, but this was an opportunity. Some of you may remember in 1980 there was a peanut crop failure, and the price of peanuts went from about, uh, peanut butter went from about 99 cents for a pound jar to like $3 and something. It was literally, at that time, 1979, 80, that was like six, seven, eight dollars now. It was a crisis. Turned out, because we'd been receiving samples, because we'd been traveling a lot, there was a particular product that Texas A&M had produced that was a particular, quote, glandless type of cotton nut kernel that when roasted, tasted a lot like a peanut kernel. And we were wondering what to do with it, along comes a peanut crisis. And suddenly, we started selling this 100% American nut butter. And the American part was at that time, there was a lot of Chinese and other peanuts being uh, imported to try to break the price of peanuts back down, had a lot of aflatoxin problems, et cetera. So it was kind of making sure customers were confident that no, this is something grown here in the United States, it's, we're not importing it from somewhere else. Uh, and then second, it was higher in protein, and we sold this for $1.29. And for a year or two, until peanut prices fell back down, we, for a little small chain, sold hundreds of thousands of pounds of this stuff. Because when it turned out you put it on bread with honey or jam, it tasted a lot like peanut butter. Now, when peanut butter came back to 99 cents a pound, bye-bye all-American nut butter, which was fine. This was an opportunity that, by being knowledgeable, by working with suppliers, and by being a flexible to be able to jump in quickly and take advantage of a situation, we were able to, one, create a product that customers had never seen before, and two, create some real value. So what you do is you end up creating these destination products. This is, this is literally a Peace Corps couple that sent me this, and I thought, oh my gosh. It was one of those moments like Saturday Night Live where Captain Kirk is uh, you know, saying, I just want to say something to you Star Trek fans about you know, those of you who've gone to all the conventions and dress up and know all the names and know all the stories of every one of our scripts. I just have something I really want to say to you. Get a life. Uh, this is one of those letters you read and says, really? You would rather have Trader Joe's chocolate-covered caramel and ginger granola than a hot showers or TV or microwave ovens, et cetera? So of course what we did, we ended up shipping them a case of, of product in Kenya. Uh, and I had a second photo, I won't show you this, of them enjoying it with a whole group of villagers. So um, point is you create product also through private label and through your knowledge of vendors, you start to find what they can do and together that brings things to the marketplace that would have never existed. When you have these products, it turns out how you tell your story really matters. So one of the part 1A, so to say, and 1B of buying is you gotta tell the story. If you simply put it on, you know, hide it under a bushel, no one will understand it. Trader Joe's, this was a, a first flyer many years ago, but what it is, it, has, it pokes a little fun at itself, part of Trader Joe's style. So basically saying, you know, gee, Joe, with you, there's always enough wind, hot air, you know, to uh, keep the boat afloat. But it's about its value. It's about its adventure. Because when you start creating these products that you can't find anywhere else, it creates a treasure hunt. It creates a sense of adventure. And customers really like that. We also, as I said, fun. Why, why, why does Trader Joe's like to poke fun at itself? Well, it does two things. One, it turns out that humor builds trust. There are a lot of studies on this that if you want to build trust with an audience, with a group, or something else, that first thing you can do is not worry yourself too heavily. So for Trader Joe's, it was the idea that, as we say, Gutenberg is supposedly up here saying, my gosh, we invented the printing press for this thing, you know? Uh, or the fact that, you know, the Fearless Flyer is rarely justified and always marginal. Not often you see other companies making such fun of themselves. And when you do, what happens is you start to build trust, like, maybe I can trust these people. You know, so our role and our job was to make sure this wasn't just clever positioning. Our role and our job as a company was to make sure it was authentic and it was part of our culture and that it was based on the, a sense of confidence, not just a marketing spin. 
As it turns out, marketing isn't just advertising, and it isn't just communication. It's really about connection. It's really about relationships. So New York Times once defined the uh, fearless flyer that Trader sends out as a cross between Consumer Reports and Mad Magazine. And uh, at the time, we were thrilled. We thought that was incredibly appropriate, and uh, we were honored. So now, let me get to the second part of what I think is really the retail reinvention, which was, believe it or not, retailers have customers. Whoa, what a concept. Turns out, unfortunately, that a lot of retailing isn't customer focused. And particularly when you go back in the earlier days. So for Trader Joe's, it turned out one of the real key learnings here was it's not just what you do, it's also how you do it. The example I gave before is a, is a shorthand for that. Southwest Airlines. I mean, you know, there are a lot of airlines that take you from point A to point B, right? But how Southwest does that is very different, and many people enjoy that. They'll, you know, they'll do it effectively and efficiently. They'll do it often at the lowest price. They won't charge you for any of the other things because, as they say, you know, that just wouldn't be very friendly or fair. And they'll have a lot of fun sometimes when you fly. As we all know, we've all had stories about, you know, and I've flown with Southwest a lot, I'm sure you have, uh, various times when they'll get on and make, you know, when they run through the regular routine of, you know, buckle your seatbelt and this or that, and they'll throw in some quips that suddenly you'll wake up and realize, wait, can you say that? You know, it's like, you know, be careful, you know, when you've landed, there, you know, when you get out your suitcase that uh, there's been, you know, some shifting or something, and it says, uh, and if you get up before we land, we'll actually have to turn around and do this all over again, you know, and so everybody goes, what? How you do things really matters. Uh, as it was mentioned in the introduction, I, I chair the board of overseers at WBUR, which is the station that produces Car Talk, which is this NPR radio station from two guys who actually have just retired this year on their regular broadcast after 35 years. But even when I lived out in Los Angeles, um, I listened to them not because I really cared about anything they had to say. I mean, nowadays, I'm not even sure I'd know that my car had a motor if I didn't have to open it up and put washer fluid in every now and then because it's all computerized. I can't change or the timing or do anything with, it with an engine anymore. I used to do that all the time when I was young. But I listen to them because it turns out that within 10 minutes, I'm laughing with them, I'm having fun, I'm enjoying it. They could be two Maytag washer repairmen talking about the advantages of front load against, against top load and should you use liquid or powder detergent, honestly, and I'd be listening to them. And by the way, that's not a subject I'm usually interested in. And so it turns out how you do something is really, really important. This is one of the real understandings we got at Trader Joe's. And what it does is it starts to create this virtuous circle instead of a vicious cycle when you start to have some sense of how important it is to stay customer focused. Then you start to realize how important your employees are. You start to look at their training and development. You start to look at the stores. Are they designed around what's best for the customer? You start to do things like move management out from behind a desk out onto the floor where they're interacting with customers. You do all the stuff that would normally happen and it starts to create this wonderful cycle where customers respond well to it. Then employees, of course, if you're a crew member, you love it when you're dealing with customers that enjoy shopping there. And it turns out customers really enjoy shopping in a spot where crew members are enjoying themselves. As president, I received numerous phone calls from customers that would say, I just want to share a story with you, why it is I love shopping at Trader Joe's, and I just had it validated today. Well, what's that? I said, well, I was in your store and I was shopping and I overheard, must have been a manager, probably was just any type of supervisor or full-time person, instructing another crew member on how to order or something like that. It was so respectful. It was, you know, they, they set it up and said, okay, I hear this, now repeat back to me. All right, so go ahead and order it, and I'll come back and review it. You know, so it, was, it wasn't, and, and, and one of them called and said, they were saying, okay, you almost had that right, except you forgot this step here, so go back. So there wasn't any of that, how could you forget that? What's wrong with you? Said, oh my gosh, I want to work here. And I said, well, we have applications. And so uh, that cycle turns out to feed on itself. 
that not only when customers are enjoying themselves, employees enjoy themselves and customers enjoy themselves, but then you start to do more sales, and guess what? Suppliers really like that. Because when you're growing, they sell you more product. And when customers love those products, they get to bask in that glory too. So it creates this virtuous cycle. Integrity design, as I mentioned, is something where you end up putting, you look at the store from a completely different point of view. You can't say you're customer focused and sell the shelf space to vendors or end caps. Sorry, that's not a customer focus. And one of the surprising, shocking statistics is that in the financial statements of 2011, Kroger and Safeway made more money off vendor allowances than they did off their EBITDA. That means that vendors are a greater source of profit than their customers are, which is probably why they perhaps lack some of the customer focus. I think that's true of the general grocery industry. I think they unfortunately have walked down a path that looks at vendors as their source of revenue instead of customers. Instead of providing customers what they want and the way they want it, when they want it, they are looking to vendors to provide that profit. So when this all happens, you create what I think is what is orbital velocity. Orbital velocity means in essence, you no longer have to put that management thrust, that rocket thrust that's so hard to get your people to do something. Things start to happen on their own, which when you're in management is just a delightful position to be in because it starts to feed on itself. Sometimes unbelievable things happen. Uh, true story, I got a letter from, uh, many letters from a customer, from, from customers, and one was a phone call that described the exact same situation. This lady had been in our Scarsdale, New York store right before a storm. Those of you who ever live back east know that one, something happens right before a storm. People go nuts and think it's the Cuban Missile Crisis, and they go in and they buy all the food on the shelves and the water and stuff. And meanwhile, I'm a guy from Los Angeles, grew up in Los Angeles. It was always stunning to me that it is snowing. You're buying water? It's like, <laughs> it's not yellow snow. So uh, anyway, what am I, I mean, I'm, as a grocer, it's like, yeah, great, buy water. I don't get it, but sure. Uh, right before the storm, she was rushing into our Scarsdale store, filled a big shopping cart full of groceries, got up to the check stand, had two little kids with her, you know, checked out, they're banging the groceries, okay, it's time to pay. <gasps> oh my God. She left her purse on the kitchen table. There's a long line of people behind her. The cashier, who happened to be what, at the time what's called a part-time cashier, didn't ring the bell, get management over there, didn't embarrass her, like, what? I buy, oh, well, now we gotta return all this. Said, you have an honest face. You know what, I've done this myself, Ugh, don't worry about it. Today, I'll pay for your groceries. And next time you're in here, just pay me back. Reaches into his back pocket, pulls out a debit card and swipes it. Pays for her groceries. She told me, I drove home, got my purse, turned right around, drove right back. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, now it's probably snowing in a blizzard and it's gonna be our fault, something terrible happened, but. Uh, <laughs> And this call is going to end up with a large lawsuit at the end of it. <laughs> no, fortunately not. I wouldn't be telling the story otherwise. What happened was, like, I went back, I paid him, I wanted to give him a tip, he wouldn't take it. I said, well, I want to make sure you get credit for this. He said, well, I'll tell my manager. And the manager said, well, if you really want to get credit, call the president, you know, sort of thing. So that's how I got involved. I would have never thought of such a thing. I mean, it's like, good heavens. When you create a culture of care, you create a culture of customer service of focusing on a customer out of one of your core values in a culture of integrity, how would you want to be treated? What would be the best circumstance if that was you and those were your kids and this had just happened to you, what would you want to have happen? When you can act that way and you can treat your customers, your suppliers, your communities, your employees that way, all kinds of magic occurs. So as I mentioned, this, this is a picture, by the way, of the Manhattan store. First one that opened up, uh, happened to open on uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day. 
and hence the green shirts and lays and things. And this, this right here is the store manager, Mark Grumbaugh, and he's out having a blast. And this was a store that got so busy, and still is, that there's a line that forms out front, and the fire department won't let us, let everybody in. They literally, we have to have someone control that. They said, you control it or we will. And if we control it, you're not gonna like it. We said, thank you, we appreciate the, uh, we appreciate the choice. So we'll put a crew member out on the street who has like the roped little thing with the velvet ro that basically says, okay, you know, the next 50 people can go in. And you, when you go in, usually nowadays, if you're shopping there, know that you come with someone. Because someone stands in line, you do the shopping, you go back and stand in line for them, they go and do the shopping, and then, because the line basically starts on the perimeter of the store as soon as you walk in. Uh, at times it's not that bad because we've opened some other stores in Manhattan, but there are times in which it's still that bad. It's not an ideal situation for Trader Joe's as far as delivering a customer experience. So they've opened as many registers as they can possibly do. So that line actually was pretty quick, I mean like really fast. It's a, maybe it's like, you know, you get your exercise jogging in place. But uh, it's an example, again, of what happens when you deliver really consistent, good quality products at a, at a fair, honest, everyday value, and you do it in an environment that is friendly and warm and inviting and hopefully honest, straightforward, so you feel as a customer that you're not getting a spin. So now, what you end up doing is you start finding what I call the and and the or, which is, there's a picture in North Carolina when we first came to, to uh, open there, the, the first day we opened. Uh, this lady said she took off work, and I thought, oh dear, you know. We're, we're open till nine at night, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, what happens is that most of us feel in life we have trade-offs. That if you're gonna step back and think about Trader Joe's, you would go, well, they have this wonderful high quality customer service. You ask about something, they walk you down the aisle. People, you know, there's people, you don't have to wonder where someone is. You know, they're, they're, they're known for a fairly high level of customer service and they're known for good prices. So how can you have high level customer service and low prices? Those seem like they are a fight. You usually have to have an either or. And I can walk down the whole list of things that, uh, that have been created, but it turns out that when you work into a virtuous cycle, you end up finding oftentimes where the and is in the either ors. You start not looking just at trade-offs, but at win-wins. And that goes with vendor relationships, employee relationships, customer relationships, and even communities. It's not often that, not often that grocers find themselves under attack because they are not opening a store in a community. That one, right, right before I uh, um, graduated from Trader Joe's, we had a campaign that the mayor of Albany and the others put together like a 7,000 a uh, letter and sign-up sheet demanding that Trader Joe's come to Albany, New York. You know, state capital. So, I mean, it's not often that you find retailers that are having community actions where they say, we want you here. This comes, I think, out of a natural reflection when you look at and you treat your communities as valuable stakeholders. So. One of the things that, that I think Traders is often proud of is the fact that every time Consumer Reports does a report like this, they usually end up tied for number one or number two with Wegmans, which is this wonderful company many of you know uh, out of Rochester, New York. Um, Danny Wegman, the whole family run that, and it's a great chain. Uh, but Trader Joe's is right there. And the thing that's really important, I think, in my mind is, I don't think you can see this, but the, the, the four levels are service, perishables, price, and cleanliness. <coughs> Trader Joe's scored middle of the road in perishables, which I think, by the way, is their weakest section in the store, is their produce and their perishables, uh, compared to all the other things they do, which I think they do absolutely phenomenally well. And, and I hope you guys can, in this room here, can help Trader Joe's figure out how to do that even better. So what they really score really high on, they're the only, of all the grocers, the only one to get two of the solid best uh, or better on bullseyes were on service and price. That's what I regard as finding the and and the either or. So, having said this, now, 
Let me divert myself for just a second to a topic that's really important. It's called disruption. So Trader Joe's, I think, reinvented retail by disrupting a number of things. Disrupting the natural wholesale chain of the way things are bought and sold. Disrupting a relationship that retailers had established, um, certainly in, in the 70s going into the 80s, of how to relate to the customer. The year I started with Trader Joe's, 1977, happened to be the same year the two guys in a garage in Cupertino brought out, as you know, the first Apple I. And if you were Smith Corona or Brother or even IBM Selectric Division, you're doing your five or 10 year planning, everything's roses, right? I mean, typewriters have been around forever. When I talk at business schools, by the way, here's one of the shocking things. This is a, without any disrespect, man, a more mature audience than the business schools. And so uh, I'll ask, how many of you have a typewriter? Thank you for sharing. Well, that was actually, I was going to ask the business class uh, that. And what happens is virtually no one raises their hand. It's, it's really an, an outlier to get someone like raise, like, you do it, yeah, my grand, it was my grandfather's, or it's like, oh, okay. Like, nobody has a typewriter. It's like, I could have asked them, how many of you have a horse and buggy? It's like, why would I have a horse and buggy? It's like, well, why would I have a typewriter? And the astonishing thing is, for those of us in the room, we all know how essential that tool was and how important that industry was. Now, the astonishing thing for me when I go out and talk to business schools is I then ask this next question. How many of you, not in a movie, not in a magazine, have actually physically ever seen a real typewriter? One or two hands will go up. And I'll just go, wow. I mean, in one generation, an entire mainstay is wiped out, gone. Like the drive-in movie theater, you know? It's like, gone. So, disruption is everywhere. Trader Joe's of 1977 was nothing like Trader Joe's of 1987, which was nothing like Trader Joe's of 1997. It is continually changing, adapting, and reinventing itself. So when we talk about Trader Joe's reinventing the way it does retail, I'd like to use that as a verb. It is reinventing. And I would suggest that all good businesses are constantly reinventing themselves. And if they're not, they're in real trouble. As mentioned in the introduction, I had the honor of going to the uh, Drucker School of Management when Peter Drucker was still alive. And I took several courses with him and I uh, won several awards, mostly because I brought Trader Joe's samples to class and bribed the, the faculty. Uh, and so the reason those awards mean anything, like most outstanding graduating student and all that, they don't mean anything for the honors themselves. They really don't. They're, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What they mean was I got to have a private lunch. I got to have a private dinner with Peter Drucker. That's all it meant to me. That was the value. And what I got from that were several takeaways that were really important. First he said was, do you know why most businesses fail? Now this is the father of management theory. I don't know if those of you that know Peter Drucker or not, this is like, you know, the guru of all gurus of management theory and thinking all this. And my mind, of course, now is the new graduated executive MBA goes to myself, well, because obviously expenses exceeded revenue. I mean, anybody knows that. But because I was with Peter Drucker, I said, no, Peter, why? He says, navel gazing. And I thought, meditating? Like, navel gazing? Like, navel gazing? Uh, first, did I hear that right? Strong Aust um, uh, Austrian accent. Navel gazing? Yes, they become myopic. Most businesses fail because they have some level of success. And they, when they have success, they stop monitoring the environment. They stop looking out for the train coming down the track. That's old saying, you know, that even if you're on the right track, you're gonna get run over if you just sit there. So, turns out this disruption is happening all the time. And I shouldn't be telling you guys this because you live it, you experience it. So the real key is to keep monitoring your environment and keep reinventing yourself as much as you can. 
So what's this mean to you, in, in my opinion? How are you going to build this business? What, what, what's, what's, is there, what are the takeaways for you? Besides, this is an interesting story about Trader Joe's, and they're very successful, and that's great. But so here's, here's some, what I'd call some takeaways. First, let's go and look at, here's a takeaway. Out-of-home food expenditures for 150 years has been falling. You can't see this, but, but this chart starts like in, what, 1850 or 60 or something like that. It's some crazy thing. It really, it's the falls right in here in the, in the, uh, uh, from the 70s on down. You can really see the drops down to where just recently, I believe, that we actually crossed the line where now more money is spent outside of the home than spent in the home for food. And what you can really see is as a share of disposable income from 1927, which was uh, basically right around the Depression where we're spending over 20%, almost 30% of our disposable income on food, it's dropped down to like 6 7%. So this is, this is one change we have to adapt to is that, that it turns out most of our money now isn't spent in the home. So for you that are in the industry providing you know, uh, food, turns out people aren't eating at home. Next is, where are they eating? So what's happening even within that, the food? Look at just 20 years, 1992 to now, supermarket industry has gone from 82% to 62% of the share. That is a dramatic drop. It's not quite typewriters, but it's letting that industry know we're not doing something right. There's something going on here. There's, there's a real disruptive force in retail. And you can see what, you know, much of it shares. Warehouse clubs and super centers, other non, you know, convenience, other non stuff. It's that there's this, and the same way we have with, uh, you know, back in the 70s, there were three main channels, right? NBC, ABC, uh, and CBS. Now there's 300 channels. Sneakers, when I was a kid, there was like high top, low top, you know, black, black and white. Now, you know, there's 20 varieties just for if you're gonna triathlon. And by gosh, you wouldn't. Uh, how do I cancel that stretch? Oh, I don't know. It's probably a really good idea. So, how do I cancel the stretch? Okay, let's cancel the stretch. It's a brilliant idea. <laughs> now, I do think stretching is important. Just to be clear, that was not part of my slide presentation. I just want to be really clear about that. Okay. And you know, where does growth occur for us? When we stretch outside our comfort zone. So this is an attempt to stretch outside of our comfort zone when we start talking about how we're reinventing and some of the challenges. For if you're a supermarket, it's time to start stretching outside your comfort zone. Things aren't working. The more you retreat back into your comfort zone, you know, the tougher it's gonna get. Uh, another factor, here's a, here's, here's a train wreck going in the wrong direction, which is, the size of the stores are growing dramatically. From 1994, this was 35,000 square feet or 6,000 to uh, 2010, which is actually slightly down because of the Great Recession from 2006. But we're talking about a 31% increase in the size of the store. Well, here's the challenge. Why are they doing that? Because they looked out and said, oh, the mass market is killing us. Target and Walmart, they're killing us. So obviously we need bigger stores. Well, if that's true, how come their sales per square foot are falling? And so is their EBITDA, and so are the return on assets. Because it turns out that you can't just copy. You've got to have a reason to differentiate yourself. Now, I already mentioned this, which I think was a stunning, just to me, like the worst wake up call for grocery industry is when you start making more money off your vendors than your customer, then you're having an EBITDA, there, there's something going on. Next is a, a friend of mine who was the CEO of Stop and Shop, uh, is in the midst of uh, writing a book, and he shared some information. As you know, the uh, Food Marketing Institute, uh, FMI, they've been polling since 2006 supermarkets to find out what's your strategies. You know, talk about your, your high level strategies. And as it turns out, all of them almost unanimously had the same strategy, which is we're putting our highest strategic. Uh, direction is in perishables emphasis. Well, respectfully, and I, I, I like the uh, quote here that uh, uh, I put in from Jose Alvarez, which is, but if everyone's doing it and it doesn't appear to be working, is it really a strategy? And if their current incarnations are not working, what can supermarkets do in the future to stay relevant? And I think that is the question, which fortunately I don't have to answer today. Uh, <laughs> 
But the question is, you, you know, if everybody else is doing the same thing, how are you going to differentiate yourself? Because at the end of the day, it gets back to that, why do you exist? Who would miss you if you disappeared? So again, when it comes back to this, adapt or die. Drucker used to say, innovate or die. This is really about this continual Kaizen, this continual improvement, continual change, monitoring the environment, making sure that you're aware of what's going on, being flexible, forming new partnerships. Instead of just holding on to the old ones, look for new and creative ways to do it. This is what Trader Joe's did. We went out and looked for new types of relationships with manufacturers, with European manufacturers, with growers. In the 70s, this was new. Today, this isn't so new. But the way in which Trader Joe's does it, I still think is relatively unique. So new partnerships, as these are just suggestions from what I see looking out that I think that it has to do with the fact when your grocery channels are shrinking in, in, in meaningful, when you've got so much innovation going on, whether it's in Amazon getting into the food business, whether it's farmers markets and food trucks in you know, all the cities, LA and Boston, and you know, have all these food trucks, you've got all of this cre creative channel you know, uh, category killer in essence, but not the typical traditional category killers. You know, in the past, category killers were, you know, Circuit City and Barnes and Noble. They were regarded as category killers, the big box, right? Well, what happened to them? You know, what happened to them was, quote, another category killer came along, but it wasn't a bigger box. It wasn't a bigger store. It was technology came along, you know? And if you were Circuit City or you're Amazon, I mean, or you're um, Barnes and Noble, the internet came along, and you didn't respond to it and position yourself as the leader. So, one other thing I think really to point out here is context to customers today is just as important as content. For a lot of customers, what that means is that values matter as much as the value you're going to deliver. What are your values? Do you treat your people well? Are you, are you a good steward? you know, to the environment? Are you a community, you know, friendly member? And guess what? It turns out they're going to know. Why? Because there's transparency today that never existed before. Ask Romney about 47%. That was a private comment made into a private group of people. Now, not too many years ago, none of us would have ever heard of that. Today, just about anything that you don't want or you don't think, you think you can keep private, good luck on that one. It's going to be on YouTube and it'll be like, you know, the old adage when I was in business years ago was, hey, don't ever say anything or do anything that you wouldn't want to be printed on the front page of the New York Times. Well, you're in New York Times, forget that, YouTube, you know, that's worse than the New York Times. So the point is that it's a changing world that you've got to be looking at the values that matter and, and transparency, whether this is in food safety issues, whether this is in you know, labor standards, whether it's in whatever, you've got to know why you're doing what you're doing. I'm not standing up here saying you should change or do anything different, but just acknowledge that whatever it is, you better have a reason for it and you better be able to defend it. And it better be a reason that makes sense, makes sense to your customer. Because if it doesn't, it won't. And when it doesn't make sense to them, they're going to start looking around at some of your competitors to whom their answers make sense. So um, I think that when it comes to reinventing, that what we're really talking about is a continual process. It's not a moment in time. There are some landmarks. Trader Joe's is continuing to reinvent itself. I expect that Trader Joe's 10 years from now will not be anything like it is today in many important ways other than its principles, its core values, and the way in which it delivers on the two wings of the bird, so to say, product and customer experience. Finally, the really big picture for all of us is that all of our businesses, whether this is Trader Joe's or the business you're in, 
can become citadels of meaning and purpose for the people that work there, for the communities you're in. They can actually make a difference in people's lives. And those lives are oftentimes, now I have a grandchild, I have, I have a grandson, and I think that you know, the things that we do will impact him. And the really big picture is make sure what you are doing is the sort of thing that you could be proud of telling your grandkids you're doing. So thank you.